Okay. All right. Well, Liz, welcome to In Search of Wisdom. Thank you very much for having me. It is uh, nice to have you. I've really enjoyed your book, which is going to be the topic of the conversation, Love Like a Saint. But before Mm -hmm. we get into the book, we generally take a few minutes and try to get to know you a little bit. I'm, I'm curious, how did you initially find your way to writing? Hmm. You know, I, I always wanted to be a writer. When I was little, uh, my parents had this writing desk and, you know, a lot of girls would be out like playing with dolls or their cooking sets or whatever. And I was always sitting at that writing desk and writing my little stories. Uh, and then I think, you know, it just happened really organically uh, in high school and and uh, about that age, I started to learn I had a real facility for that. And I got some encouragement. And I ended up going and doing a master's degree in writing. And um, and I always thought I would write fiction. And I have published some fiction. Uh, but uh, a gentleman saw something that I had written on prayer one day and called me up and started recruiting me to write more about the life of the spirit and spiritual things and my faith life. And I found I had a real facility for that and a real joy in, in doing that work. Um, So that's where my first book came from. And then the second book. And (laughs) so it just kind Mm -hmm. of really organically blossomed uh, from the encouragement I had when I was young. And it was just such a desire of my heart. Um, always uh to write it's always been uh one of the great joys and one of the ways that i really pray mm. nice and it, and it's so nice to hear that there was encouragement you know there along with mm-hmm. uh, this joy for it mm-hmm. um probably a standard uh follow up question that i ask most guests to share a bit of wisdom with the listeners of <laughs> I'm always thinking of the listener that is maybe discerning their particular, you know, way in life. Maybe it's a fork in the road. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's many paths before them. You know, Mm -hmm. how do you think about finding your your way? Any any uh, thoughts you Mm -hmm. could share with the listeners? I I do. I have tons (laughs) because this was a a really important thing. I can remember coming to a crux where I was trying to decide whether I would go to law school or if I would do an MFA in writing. And um, my father, who was a judge at the time, and like I have sisters and brothers who are attorneys, they all married attorneys, except for, you know, one (laughs) brother who's a priest, you know. Um, And I was talking to my dad about it. And I said, you know, I just don't know what to do. And he said, you know, as uh, you would make an excellent attorney, he said, you love to make arguments. You have, you're a really clear thinker. You would be very, very good at that. And I thought he was kind of finished. And then he said, but when you write, he said, I don't even know where that comes from. And he said, that to me seems like something really special. And in that moment, you know, my father gave me such affirmation that not only was I given a gift that was different from his, you know, but that it was very special, uh, it was unique, and he was giving me permission to choose a completely different path from the path that he chose, you know, and law would have been in many ways a much more secure path, <laughs> <laughs> you know, trying to write and speak and all of that, it's its a tough gig and it doesn't always pay very much. And, you know, there are a lot more question marks. And so in that moment of just being validated in my gift in that way, that was really huge. And I think those are markers to look for. In my case, because of the kind of writing that I do, um, you know, we would consider it, you know, in my in 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 my faith, we would call it a charism, you know, a gift that God has given you. And it's a gift that God wants you to use, not only for the benefit of your own soul, but for the benefit of others. And so you start to look for that evidence. And, you know, I would get people who would contact me and say, boy, what you wrote about X really helped me, you know. So there was there was affirmation that I had been given a gift Um, it brought me great joy. It helped me to grow as a human, but it also helped and served others. Others were benefited when I was active in my charism. 
And so that's definitely something to look for, you know, whether your charism is hospitality or healing or administration or knowledge or teaching or whatever it is, you will, I think, experience intrinsically a sense of self-forgetful joy. You know, I can write for hours. And I just, and it, the time just goes and I don't even know where it goes. There's a kind of self forgetful, almost playfulness with God that I experience. We're co creating this thing together. Uh, but also then the fruit of that work goes on to serve other people and to help other mm-hmm. people. Uh, so those are two really big things to, to look for. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for that. That's a, that's a great, um, intro into the book here as well. This is mm-hmm. primarily a philosophy podcast and we cover a lot of different things. Um, but we try to start by, from a very basic level, identifying, uh, terms and maybe defining terms and things like that. So mm-hmm. I thought we could, um, mm-hmm. you know, for, for any listeners that might not be uh, familiar, I thought we could just talk about, you know, the word saint. How would you describe hmm. a saint? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, in a technical aspect, I think it's someone who lives virtue in, to a heroic degree. So uh, someone whose life is, is uh, very tested in some capacity and is able to make the loving choice despite that. For example... I was uh I've been I've been spending a year or two reading the writing of Saint Maximilian Kolbe and he's known as the saint of Auschwitz. Uh he was arrested and um the the group that he was with was going to be punished. They were going to choose 10 people in his group to go to the starvation bunker. And there was a a man who stepped forward at who was or who was being pulled forward and he said, "Please I'm the only thing my son has, you know, I'm the only thing my son has. And so Maximilian, Father Maximilian at that point stepped forward and he said, I will take this man's place in the starvation bunker. Uh, And incidentally, that man was at St. Maximilian's canonization in Rome. He survived the war and was able to attend that. So Maximilian goes into the starvation bunker and during that entire time, He's serving the people that he's with. He's praying with them. He's um, trying to lead them in uh, spending the last days of their life with the greatest amount of meaning and joy that they possibly can, which in and of itself is an heroic thing. Uh, He gives his life for another. And then at the very end, you know, he didn't starve to death in the 10 days. He was the last alive. And so the Nazis decided at that point that they would just have to outright kill him. And and they were going to inject him with, I think it was carbolic acid. And so he raised his arm to his executioner and, you know, participated in this, um, you know, forgiving his executioner for taking his life. Now, that's pretty, <laughs> that's pretty extraordinary yeah. uh, virtue. Now, he had led a life all the way up to that. Um uh, practicing, growing, developing. His life was not a picnic up until that point. He had a lot of opportunities to grow in that virtue so that when he made that final decision, um, it was something he was very well prepared to do. And um, when he was very young, he had a mystical experience where the Blessed Mother appeared before him. This is the Mother of God in uh, Catholic life. And she offered him a red crown or a white crown. The red would be that he would live, he would live, uh, uh, or he would die a martyr's death. And the white crown would be that he would die a very holy death, live as a sanctified, holy person his whole life. And she said, you know, you can choose either one. And he said, I'll take both. (laughs) You know, he was just a little boy. So you know, even as a child, you know, he had sort of an extraordinary capacity to step into that river of grace uh, and receive an extraordinary heroic amount of grace such that he could live such an heroic life. So, uh, you know, I think of there are a lot of 
saints that we can point to. Mother Teresa, for example, she did not give her life as a martyr, but she gave her whole life as a servant to the poorest of the poor in such an heroic way. Um, so I hope that helps kind of clarify the way Catholics think about it. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a fascinating thing, this uh, tradition of, you'd say, like, lives of the saints um we have a couple of those mm -hmm. you know books around and and sometimes they're they're written you know for young people but also in uh, you know other mm -hmm. traditions you think back to diogenes of laertes like lives of eminent philosophers this sure kind of holding up another life to mm -hmm. follow or you know, gain some sort of mm -hmm. inspiration. And I think you mm -hmm. wrote in the, in the book that, you know, early on you had a bit of a fascination with, with some of the saints. Could you speak to that a bit? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, I don't remember how old I was, but I remember reading one of the popes and he talked about um, really the Christian life is the art of being human. That, mm. um, uh, to, to lead a gorgeous, beautiful human life, the most humane human life that you can is, is, uh, really something worthy. And of course he's drawing from the Greeks when he expresses it that way. And, um, as a little kid, uh, I always wanted to be an artist. I was going to either be a painter or an astronaut, you know, one or the other. <laughs> and uh, I didn't quite uh, survive physics. You know, I didn't have the mind for physics. But I always studied art and painting. And, and, and that was just very attractive to me, the thought that being a great human being had, was an artistic <laughs> endeavor, that there was beauty in it. You know, there was beauty in it. And um, and because beauty is such an introduction to God, you know, beauty teaches us something about order, about um, the things we were created for. You know, all of these things kind of started to swirl in my head. And um, uh, and for whatever reason, too, um, even in high school, I got really fascinated with um, World War II. My husband and I are both kind of history buffs around that particular uh, scourge uh, in the world. And um, there are so many stories to pull from that horror of extraordinary love, extraordinary um, self-giving, uh, extraordinary sacrifice. Um, and uh, it was a way, I think, that I could begin to make sense as a young person of holding in, you know, this dynamic tension, the capacity to be Hitler or Mother Teresa, you know, <laughs> and, you know, mm -hmm. how do we how do we choose one road over the other? And that um, also, you know, it really established very firmly in me. And my parents were very strong about this, too. They just talk about how God uses everything. Even the evil can be turned to good. Even the darkness can, you know, he can draw light from even the darkness. And I saw this so much in uh, especially, you know, the saints from World War II. We think of St. Edith Stein, who was, you know, sent to the death camps and 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 many others, or Alfred Delp. I've been reading Alfred Delp lately. Just magnificent. He was very um, he was very involved in the resistance movement, and was arrested as a Vatican spy, and you know later murdered, and all of this. But he made this beautiful distinction. He was talking about we want to live as candles. <laughs> that is by burning and giving light we are being consumed, you know, our, our lives are not being destroyed. They are being sacrificed. You know, you want to live like the mm -hmm. candle where your light gives off light, even though it's burning down, burning down, burning down. Um, it's not a destruction. It's a sacrifice. So I think I found in these in these voices, in these figures, and, you know, many of them very, very learned, you know, uh, Delp was, you know, a PhD and, and you know, uh, uh, 
uh, and uh, Ignatian and, and very studied, you know, same with Kolbe and St. Teresa uh, or St. Edith Stein. Uh, these were incredibly well-formed people. And Edith, for example, was a philosopher. I'm sure you know her work. And I just think, oh, what yeah. she might have accomplished in her work if they she hadn't been taken so soon. Um, but I love that philosophy and theology uphold each other and in particular in a in sort of catholic education tradition you study philosophy before you go on to study theology it's like you have to have your mind ordered properly before you can go on to consider these higher things and uh, it's still the case you know it's still the case our seminarians get a philosophy degree before they study theology so it's a lot of overlay <laughs> yeah yeah, it's so so fascinating. I have to say, I I love the um, the the visual of live like a candle. I think that'll mm -hmm. uh, I think that'll stick with me and probably many of the listeners. Um, mm -hmm. An interesting thing I wanted to ask you about is, you know, this idea of lives to the saint, lives of the saints, and you know, you're mm -hmm. you're you're looking at this virtuous life. Uh, to a heroic degree, as you put it, but then it's it's not necessarily an exact recipe for us to follow. I made a quote mm -hmm. from the book. You you say what you bring to sainthood, however small or hidden or uneventful it may seem, has been imparted uniquely to you. So this like mm -hmm. unique call this unique path that we mm -hmm. are you know supposed to embark upon mm -hmm. how do you think about it's that really, how do you like discern that yeah you know it's a really christian idea the idea of the person the person as unique un unrepeatable um, no one is going to have the same life. No one has the same soul as you. You're like a snowflake. There's not ever going to be another one exactly <laughs> like you. And so the fact that I may not be able to offer myself to the starvation bunker, you know, I might not have been one of the brave ones who did something like that. It doesn't mean that I'm not called to live a life that is gorgeous and beautiful in all of eternity and to do what I'm supposed to do. Um, and I think there's great freedom in this Christian notion that you are unique and unrepeatable, that there is work that has been entrusted to you. There's a life that's been entrusted to you that has not been entrusted to any other. Because of that, I have freedom to express what that unique thing is. You know, um, and it's helpful to look at the lives of saints or other people that we admire, great minds that we admire, um, to see how they ordered themselves so that, you know, I can order myself to achieve the greatest possible good from my life. You know, and I think sometimes, I mean, especially, um, especially in this day and age and in our culture, um, we have such great wealth that it's hard for us to kind of place ourselves on a global scale. I can remember I interviewed Kevin Bales years ago. He's very active in freeing the slaves. And and um, he wrote this beautiful book called Disposable People. And he was talking about contemporary slavery and how it's actually worse than the slavery from antiquity because um, when slavery was legal, you had reason to keep your slaves healthy and well-fed and strong. You know, you wanted them out in the field. But now that it's illegal, we just use people up in the slave industry and then we toss them out and we go steal another person. You know, so he was just talking about this. And in that conversation, he said, you know, if you own your own car, you live in the top, uh, you know, one or two percent of wealth in the world. If you own your own home, you're in the top half percent of wealth in the world. Given that landscape, I think it sometimes can be hard for people who live in in uh, wealthier areas to imagine that they could participate in a kind of sanctified 
life, you know. Uh, but I think there's great sanctification in even the smaller details, you know, the sacrifices we make for our family, the sacrifices we make for our our our, our neighbors. Um, you know, is our home open and hospitable? I mean, we can't underestimate or don't want to diminish uh, the smaller things that we do to live an artful human life. Um, we can't only measure it against people who give up their physical life in a death camp, you know? <laughs> so we want to bring it down yeah. to our daily scale of just the daily choices that we make to achieve the greatest possible good. Um, I, I, I don't want to diminish those. Those are really important too. Yeah. Such an important point that is, um, it's just so easy to forget in, in daily life. Um, I'm I'm thinking of some of those memorable quotes from Mother Teresa trying to stress that that point of, you know, feed mm -hmm. one person, simply yeah, smile. Right. You know. Right. Yeah. Um But uh I, I thought this could be yeah, a, Carol a good opportunity. Oh, go go ahead. I'm sorry. It seems like we got a little bit of oh, a lag. Oh, I was just going to say, Carol, Carol Hauslander used to talk about, she was writing all through World War II, and she said, smile on the bus. <laughs> you know, that can be an heroic act, is just to smile on the bus and connect with another human when we have this huge trauma going on. So uh, I, I like those those smaller things that are so much more manageable. Um especially when we talk about sort of beginning this journey of, of trying to live a life that's really sanctified. Yeah. Uh, I thought um, we could maybe talk a little bit about the lives of a couple of the saints that you write about in the, in the book. Um, mm -hmm. One mm -hmm. lesser known individual. I, I may, uh, butcher the pronunciation of the name so please help me out but uh <laughs> who is elisabetta conori mora mora elisabetta conori mora that would be the uh, mm, uh more italian <laughs> uh, pronunciation just uh really a magnificent story uh she married into um a rather abusive relationship and um and and at the top i want to be very clear to say if you are in an abusive relationship you know you have every right to protect yourself to leave and you know all of that um in her case she had this really strong sense that she was supposed to stay in her marriage despite some of the just egregious abuses he was unfaithful he you know he was mean and um uh, and that she was really to guard, especially her children, from hating their father. Um, but she had a very, very strong uh, relationship with God. She had sort of mystical experiences with him. So again, I just want to be really clear. I would never recommend to someone who's in an abusive relationship to stay there. If you are in an abusive relationship, tell somebody, get help tell me, you know, send me an email. We'll, we'll figure it out. But the cool thing about Elisabetta is that she wasn't in any kind of private, she wasn't hiding the fact that she was in an abusive relationship. Her friends knew, her spiritual director knew, you know, she was, uh, she, she was known. This was not something that she was hiding from the world. And when friends and others would recommend to her to leave, you know, she would say, I have been given a very specific kind of directive from, from God, an option to stay. And that if I stay, uh, there will be great good that comes from this. And so she wasn't a doormat. You know, I don't want to give anybody the idea that she was a doormat. And she even used to tease her husband. She had a very strong sense that he was going to have a real experience of um, kind of a conversion of life after she died. 
and in fact he did um she after she passed away she had a very holy death uh she gave forgave her husband you know um her husband did have this huge conversion he suddenly realized how horrible he had been and he made a very dramatic change in his life uh lived as a penitent you know lived very poorly for many years and then eventually he uh joined a religious order became a priest um and so everything that elizabeth had been intuiting in her prayer life did come to pass um so her, her life is very very un, unusual and she had an extraordinary capacity i think for patience um and forgiveness uh to see her situation in the long view you know to see her situation in the in the long scale measuring everything against eternity and trusting that there was this version of her husband that was in there you know somewhere that mm -hmm. was uh, a really good good man and she just firmly believed in that even though she never got to see it hmm. yeah it's uh it's fascinating and if you talk about um patience there I was wondering if you could say more about the virtue of patience and then maybe connect mm. the dots with, with love. It seems like it, we can easily mm. overlook the role that patience plays. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have come to understand patience as not so much a virtue that I practice, but it's a gift that I give. It's a gift that I give to the person I'm being patient with. And um, uh, and I think about um, in my own life, um, for example, um, I always had this view that uh, my younger brother and I are very close. And I always had this view that he and I were going to be kind of shoulder to shoulder together in working together for the church and he's he's the priest and um and there were many 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 years decades where that was not happening <laughs> and it wasn't really happening until i was in my 50s and so on and so forth but i'll never forget this um just having this sense and that i needed to be patient about the coming of of this the full fruition of this idea that he and i would be sort of working shoulder to shoulder and i'll never forget it he was in rome and um and he was texting me you know and i had just come home from teaching a night class and i was exhausted and he's in rome and it's 4 a.m and he's exhausted and we're texting back and forth and he was saying how he had to give this uh he had to give this talk when he got back from rome and he's like i have no idea what i'm going to talk about and it was for a retreat for a group of priests. And he says, I'm so exhausted. I don't know what I'm going to speak on. And I said, why don't you speak about exhaustion? <laughs> why don't you speak about, you know, allowing yourself to be exhausted? Because, you know, every one of these guys in the room are going to know exactly what you're talking about. You know, why don't you give them permission to be exhausted before the Lord? So he opens up a Google Doc. And I'm I'm putting quotes in there from things that I think will be helpful to him. And he's putting stuff in there. And so, you know, before, you know, an hour is up, I can feel the relief, just this weight lifting off of his shoulders about what he was going to write about. And I'm going to bed with this huge smile on my face because I've been able to help him and support him even across the ocean, you know, here I am in my little Minnesota living room and he's, he's in Italy. Um, and I went to bed that night, um, just saying, Oh God, I was so impatient for this. I have dreamed of this my whole <laughs> life, this kind of really deep connection with my brother. And I was so impatient. I wanted it now, now, now. And I didn't realize that it wouldn't be needed until later. You know, it wouldn't be needed until later. So, 
you know, patience is a very loving gift because it trusts, you know, it, it, it trusts in the outcome, you know, and, and that requires a lot of love to do that. You know, trust always requires a great deal of love. Uh, and in that case, it was like patience was a gift that I could have wrapped up and just given to God and say, okay, you know, you've given me this <laughs> desire of my heart. It is going to come to pass. I just, I just have to wait for the right time for it. And, you know, now, you know, my brother and I work so much together that, you know, I wish I could do more for him. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> I, I, you know, in case you can't tell, my hair's been on sabbatical because I had chemo and cancer and all of that. It's, it's coming back from its long vacation. But, um, you know, while I was sick, I wasn't able to help him as much as I would have liked. So, uh, yeah, P it, cancer teaches you a lot about patience, too. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Mm. You have to learn to be loving with yourself, with your body, with its limitations. <laughs> yeah, I'm so sorry to hear that, Liz. Um, no, glad it. It sounds like I'm you're right. doing uh, much better, much better today. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I'm. I was only stage one, and so I. There's a lot to be grateful for. There's no reason why I won't make a. I, there's no reason to suspect I won't make a full recovery. So there's a lot to be grateful for. Yeah. Well, good. Glad to hear. Um, mm -hmm. Another saint, which is um, probably more, much more well known to the listeners is St. Mary Magdalene, who you close out the, mm -hmm. the book with. Could you talk a little bit about mm -hmm. her life and maybe what we can learn about love from her? Hmm. Mm. I have always been very attracted to her story because uh, she started out in such a dark place. You know, we're introduced to her as, you know, the woman from whom, you know, seven demons were delivered, whether that was mental illness or physical illness or, you know, up forthright demons, you know, I don't know, a combination of all those things. I don't know. But I can imagine that would be a very troubled and very painful place. And what I love about her story is that, you know, after she's delivered and she's um, brought into proper order, <laughs> is we're not supposed to be possessed. We're not supposed to be ill. We're not, you know, we're not created for that. So she's sort of restored to this order where she can live her life more um, humanly and genuinely and uh you know she becomes a great um a great follower of Christ and she stays with him through his great suffering just like he came to her in her great suffering and freed her from that you know she stays with him while he's suffering on the cross and in his way a great support for him in that we know most of the apostles ran away, you know, but she stayed. And then even after he was entombed, her sorrow was so great, she just didn't even want to leave, you know, the tomb. And how beautiful that her great love for him also resulted in her receiving, you know, the most important information on earth that, you know, Christ was resurrected. He calls her by name. He reaches out, you know, she reaches out to him. Um, so the fact that she was entrusted with this knowledge that Christ would appear to her in this way, it does so many things for me. On, on so many levels, it tells me how um, important women are <laughs> in the gospel, you know, that they were the first receivers of this very important information. Um, but also just her very great love kind of helped facilitate that revelation. Uh, her love was what kept her at the tomb. And so because of her love, she was able to receive, you know, this great grace of the revelation of Christ. So. Um, I don't know if that's really answering your question, uh, about, uh, love, but 
I, I, I love the tie of her receiving that great lo- healing love and then offering it in return and then receiving it again. You know, it's a spiritual <clears throat> kind of law, I think. You know, the love that we give comes back to us in ways that we cannot imagine, that we can't conjure. Um, when we are generous with that, uh, it's always met. It's always met and received and given back a hundredfold. I think about this with my brother. When he entered seminary, I kind of lost him. You know, he was now engaged in this whole other life. Um, And I kind of lost my brother. But what I didn't know was going to happen is I gained a hundred (laughs) more. You know, now I have all these priest friends Mm -hmm. that I've met through him. And now it's like I have a hundred brothers. You know, I always wanted more brothers. There are five (laughs) girls and two boys in our family. And I always wanted more brothers. I always felt like that was unfair somehow. So now I have all of these, all of these new brothers. It's, It's so in giving him up and saying, you go do what you have to do. I'm going to give you to your life in the church, you know, I'm going to miss you, but uh, you have to go do what you have to do. But still, you know, it comes back. And I think Magdalene's story teaches us that very concretely. Yeah, beautiful. I am I made mm-hmm. a quote from um, that chapter. You include the quote mm-hmm. at the bottom, all love is undeserved. We can neither earn it. Mm-hmm nor promote it. It is always pure gift. It, it seems mm-hmm. like a tough lesson for us here in modern mm-hmm. life. We don't always think of, of love that way. Right, right. Um, I, I would add to, I mean, I think the human person, because they're human, has a right to that. Um, has a right to be loved, you know, so we have to kind of keep these things in a dynamic tension. The human person was created for love and yet love is still a gift, you know, and these two things can exist in this kind of dynamic tension. Um, You know, I think just being human, you have a right to be loved. You have a right to the gospel message. You have a right to know that you were created for eternity. You were created for a beautiful life. Um, and <laughs> we have to participate in that. We have to uh, we have to learn that skill. We have to learn how to love. We have to learn. Uh, you know, the family is the great school of love. It teaches us how to love and sacrifice and how to burn like a candle. <laughs> you don't burn the house down, but you burn like a candle, you know, and in that way, again, you're not destroyed, but you are sacrificed. And that's the most beautiful thing is to be used for the purpose for which you were created. And a candle is created to be burned, to bring its light mm-hmm. and to sacrifice itself that way. And so um, I want to do that too. I want to be used for the purpose for which I was created. And that is not destroying me. That is sacrificing me. And that's the most beautiful thing I can, I can offer the world. When you talk about learning to love, cultivating in the way of a skill, at the, at the end of the chapters, you have some Maybe uh, you'd call it like guided exercises for journaling and then for prayer. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little Mm -hmm. bit about practices like spiritual journaling and prayer of how they might help us to cultivate this skill of learning to love? Mm -hmm. I am such a writer at heart. I mean, some people I think hear the word journaling and they go, ah, I would never want to do that. But uh, for me, it's been, I don't really know what I think about something until I've written it down. (laughs) You know, that's how I process things. That's how I process the um, uh, problems and solutions and that sort of thing. And so praying in that way, praying at writing as prayer, praying with scripture, is just one of the ways that um, I have learned to uh, facilitate that, that process to open up myself, not just my mind, but my soul to, um, to, to receiving guidance and wisdom about um, 
how to go forward, what kind of choices to make in my everyday life. Um, and for me, prayer and journaling is a lot about just waiting and patience. Um, I want to wait for all the information to come in for me to make the best possible decision about whatever. And uh, I'm not very patient by nature. I just want things now, 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 now. And so one of the things that prayer and journaling does for me is it helps me to practice and work out that muscle of being patient and thinking things through, being patient, waiting for information to come through. Um, and it's also just for me, a very effective way of like sort of pouring out my frustrations or my emotions on the page. And so they're out there and they're not broiling inside me. You know, I have some place where I can put them and look at them and go, okay. Um, uh, so for me, prayer and writing is, is very clarifying and it helps to center me, um, if I'm sort of swirling around with the world, there's just so much going on. There's so much data coming at us from so many different places. You know, even while we're sitting here, my phone's going off and the dog is barking upstairs and the, you know, just all these different things are going on. But, um, you know, especially if I take my prayer time in the morning, it just helps to center me. And so I am making decisions throughout my day from a place that is recollected and not reactive. I'm not just reacting to the world. I am responding to the world that I have been given in that mm -hmm. day. Um, so those things are very important to me. I don't want to just be reacting to every little bit of information that comes in. I'll just be a superficial mess. I want to respond yeah. to the legitimate needs that are before me. Mm. I'm I'm curious to ask as you're talking about it there, like reacting, responding. Something that's always fascinating to me is the the notion of receiving love, and and maybe it mm. comes like the 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 virtue of patience. Sometimes like the the ability to to slow down and you know re receive love, whether that's love from the world, love from God whatever it may be, um, it's so mm -hmm. easy for us to miss the things mm. that are right in front of us, love being one mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. I think of a story, a girlfriend of mine went on retreat and it was a silent retreat. And she was there with another woman who was um, further on in years, had a lot of wisdom and ex lived experience. And she observed this older woman every morning she would take a chair out and while well, it was still dark and set it in this one particular place and she would watch the sunrise and they were in the country and it was just this magnificent it was there were trees in the river and you know the sun's coming up and it's orange and yellow and pink and you know just and so my friends started doing the same thing. She'd come and she'd situate a chair out there, but she'd always want to, you know, get going back to her room. And, uh, <laughs> and the elderly woman would sit there and just wait. She let the whole thing unfold. You know, she had this tremendous patience. She didn't miss any part of it. She like really waited and let it unfold. And so by the last day, you know, my friend was doing the same thing, just letting it unfold. And this is a silent retreat. They're not speaking to one another. But at the end of the last day, the little old woman sort of looked at her and gave her a smile and kind of like, you got it, kid. You know, you, you're starting to understand, you know, <laughs> give it time, let it unfold, let it, you know, unveil its beauty before you and just soak it in, receive it. Don't be in such a hurry uh, to get onto your to-do list. And, um, and I loved that story. I loved that, that that woman was teaching her just in her example without saying a word. And that, one of the gifts my friend took away from that was just to be patient in receiving the beauty that um, that is there for you, that is given for you. Uh, and, and it really helped her. And her telling me that story helped me too. <laughs> yeah, I love that story as well. I appreciate you sharing it. Mm -hmm. um, our time has flown by here, Liz. We've, we've made it mm. to this uh, 
final wrap up question that we asked most guests, which is um, around wisdom. How do you define or or think about wisdom in in daily life? So, what comes to mind around mm-hmm. that? Yeah, well, um, from a, a Catholic perspective, I really love the definition that Father Wickham uses of wisdom, and he says that it is to carry interiorly the resurrected Christ um, in all things. So another way that you could interpret that would be to remember what I'm created for, to remember what I am created for, and to move through my day from that understanding. Um, and, And to to live kind of from an eternal perspective, you know, looking back on this day at the end of my life, you know, am I going to be able to say I've achieved the greatest possible good I could from it, even in the small daily things, you know? Um, so for me, wisdom is really operating, responding to, operating from that place that understands what I was created for. Mm, beautiful. Well, thank you so much. And that is a great way to to wrap up the conversation. Again, uh, your book is Love Like a Saint. I highly recommend it. Are there any other books or websites that you might like to point our listeners to? Uh, sure. There are a couple of talks on my website that are free, and that's just lizk.com. Org. And if you go to speaking and events tab, there are a number of talks on there. Um, and one is from Love Like a Saint. It talks about a beautiful young woman. Um, uh, uh, oh, gosh, her name's escaping me. I, I speak about her all the time. Um, Benedetta, sorry. Uh, Benedetta uh, was uh, is a blessed, but she, she lived in the 60s and, and um or she lived right through World War II and into the 60s. Extraordinary young woman, suffered a chronic progressive illness. So if you suffer from one of those or you care from someone, care for someone who does, you, her story could be very helpful to you. Um, blessed Elisabetta. Um, and, uh, um, oh gosh, there are so many books. I, I wouldn't know where to begin. Uh, but if you want to learn more about the saints, that might be one place to, stop off nice all right well we'll link uh your book and the website uh in the show notes so it's easy to find for folks great uh elizabeth kelly thank you, thank you again for coming on in search of wisdom thank you thanks for having me